Hi! So basically, I'm in Vienna, and I thought it would be interesting to try to um, explain what I'm learning in my Viennese history classes um, to the camera, because A, history is really cool, B, talking helps me learn it, so maybe like if I'm giving a pretend lecture, like it'll help. And C, I think people don't know enough about Vienna or Austria in general, and it gets kind of overlooked, and that should stop. So when I learn something cool about Austria and how important it is, I'm going to try to remember to share it. Vienna has been around for a really long time, and at times it's actually been a huge empire. Um, my mom will like this a lot. Vienna was founded originally by the Celts. It was this tiny little, you know, village, Celtic village, but it was set up in kind of a really perfect area because we've got the Wienerwald, which is like a forest um, that's really rich in resources. It's right on the Danube, so you've got your water, your fish, you know, that all that jazz. Um, you've got the mountains nearby, so it's like clean water and like there's all sorts of good reasons to have mountains nearby and then a river on the other side so you've got like the protection there. The Celts called it Vania or Vedunia, one or the other. It was named for the Danube. It's a really great place for the salt trade, um, which is still kind of echoed today. Salzburg means like salt palace, kind of, um, I think. I'm in beginner German. Anyway, perfectly located on trade lines for white gold and um, stuff like that. The Celts loved it, it was great. Until of course the Romans came. Classic story of the Celts versus the Romans. But the Romans then ended up living there because it's, again, really perfect resource-wise. So it's like a really good place to be also for military encampment, which is what the Romans were all about. They like set up a little military camp um, in what they called Vindabona which um, has something to do with how great the wine is, I think, or something like that, <laughs> or at least the beauty of the area. Um, and so that was cool. Soldiers lived in what is now the first district of Vienna, although an albeit much smaller piece of it. And then the 30,000 civilians lived outside the military encampment in what is now the third district. Go figure. But yeah, so the Romans did a lot of stuff that the Romans did kind of everywhere, you know, religion, um, really good administration, the military was really good, they set up trade lines, whatever, and that was kind of the establishment of Vienna as like a really important crossroads in terms of um, grander cultural things and stuff like that. So that's pretty sweet. Super interesting. The Romans had to leave because there was like really heavy migration from the east, so we've got the Huns, the Gothics, um, Slav, Slavic peoples, and um, then eventually the Hungarians. Although, of course, like the Roman influence stayed behind. The city was already built, very Romanesque. So there were Romans, of course, that stayed behind and like married, you know, Goths and Huns, stuff like that. I don't know, do you say Goths? That seems weird. That was pretty cool. And then Charlemagne came around, and Charlemagne was super important because he like, you know, started the Holy Roman Empire of German nations which my teacher has said multiple times was neither holy, nor Roman, nor German. Um, so that's interesting. But it, it was sort of like a lot of Germanic peoples were encompassed in this, um, which included a lot of people in Austria, or what would eventually become Austria. It was kind of on the outskirts of the Holy Roman Empire, so it was up for <laughs> grabs basically from you know, the Slavs and the Hungarians and stuff like that that like really wanted the land. And so eventually someone sent this like dude to go watch it because they were like, this is probably actually a really important piece of land because it's like, again, on those trade lines, it's like well protected, it's got a lot of cool resources, you know, we should maybe like keep up with this tiny little piece of land and make sure that it stays ours. He sent this dude who was named um, Babenberger and the Babenberg like house her family eventually ended up ruling it was the predecessor to the Habsburgs, um, which is kind of cool. And the Habsburgs are of course incredible, like it changed generations a couple times, but the Habsburgs is one of like the longest ruling families, several of the Habsburgs ruled for like some of the longest times to rule ever, like Franz Josef ruled something like I think 68 years, and like Queen Victoria who also ruled a long time I think was 64 years, so it's like 
that's a long time to rule as an individual. Pretty incredible actually, did a lot of stuff and like really influenced what is now Austrian culture. Um, the Babenbergs. What was it? like at first was called the Habsburg Empire and then was eventually known as the Austro-Hungarian Empire after like a couple things changed, but it was the same territory and the same family that was ruling it. Um, so this is like this huge empire that spanned a large amount of Europe. Um, and eventually there was this war over Spain, not that long ago actually, it was like within the past 200 years. France and Austria were the two that like went head to head and the Austro-Hungarian Empire won and took that throne, which means basically that they own not only Spain, but all of the Spanish territories, which at the time included basically all of South America minus Brazil. I think it was like the third biggest empire in Europe and the fifth strongest military power in Europe at the time of the Great War. Um, Franz Josef had suffered a lot of loss in his life. He lost his brother Maximilian in Mexico. Um, his son Rudolf committed suicide, murder-suicide with um, or double suicide with um, a mistress who was only 16. Franz Josef's wife, Cece, was murdered. An anarchist stabbed her because whoever he was supposed to be assassinating didn't show up. So Franz Josef had lost a lot and had no heir. And so the crown prince then was Franz Ferdinand, the Archduke. Um, you might know a thing or two about Franz Ferdinand. Basically, he was also in love with someone he shouldn't have been in love with. She was Czech and not of an imperial noble family. She was like, she was, I think, nobility, but not noble enough for the Habsburgs. They had really strict rules about who was noble enough to be part of the noble club. That's a bad joke. Well, all right, if you marry her, she's not the crown princess. Like, you're crown prince, she gets no title, her children will never rule, and she's not allowed to go with you to any of the events that you have to go to. He got married to her anyway though, and then um, he also had this other role as the um, inspector of the army, and he, when he was fulfilling that role, he was allowed to take his wife with him. So he was gonna go to Sarajevo for this event where his role was the inspector of the army at that point. So he was like, this is great, it's me and my wife's 15th anniversary, I'm gonna have a surprise for her there, we'll both get there. Um, and like have like a second honeymoon kind of and as soon as they got there they were both killed um, and a month later Franz Josef declared war on Serbia for um, convincing a handful of 19 year old Bosnians to um, kill the crown prince of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and it started what they had no idea would end up becoming at the time the biggest most horrible war that the world had ever seen. After the World War I happened, um, World War II was kind of in the making with Hitler rising to power in Germany, and Hitler was like, there's a lot of German people in Austria, in Poland, in, you know, all of the places that he initially took over, basically. And um, that was why he felt like he had a claim to these places, or why he made Germany feel like they had a claim to these places. The Austrians were kind of like, willing to listen to his message a little bit because their entire empire, which at one point had included basically almost all of South America, large chunks of Central Europe had been disbanded and now Austria is this tiny country that's like a third of the size of Germany. What Germany had in mind for um, the continuation kind of of the First Great War and taking back what was rightfully theirs as German people and sort of rekindling the idea of that like Empire of German nations, which is why Austria ended up being part of the Second World War. So that's basically a brief history kind of from all the way to, from the Celts in the BCE to um, World War II. Hopefully I'll be able to go into more detail as I take these history classes. I hope you're having a great day and a great week and that everything is going well. And I will talk to you soon. Bye! Um, for example, um, uh, great, up to a great start. <laughs>